chair, and then um, I will come up, and then the graduates, and then the slides. So if you just want to, I don't know how you want to have me come, but. And then at the very end. All right, please have a seat. <laughs> All right, just remember, next weekend is Memorial Day, and uh, there's no children's church next Sunday. Next Sunday school. Sunday school. No Sunday school. But there's children's church. No. No Sunday school. No. You get me confused. <laughs> oh, both of them. All right, none. <laughs> All right, today, if you signed up for the uh, Senior Recognition Sunday banquet, uh, remember it's today. And if, even if you haven't, it's over in the power box after the service. Uh, okay, on Tuesday, we have <clears throat> the governing board meeting. It's at 5 o'clock here in the church. And then Wednesday, over at the Gray's house, we have a, a Bible study on Acts chapter 18. Thursday, of course, is ladies' study, hope for the hurting. And then uh, Saturday, we have 7 a.m. as men's prayer. And then upcoming events, uh, Christian Education Appreciation Luncheon is June 5th after the second service. You need to sign up in the back because they don't know who's all coming. All right, so if you plan on coming, that's any teachers. Here, let me read it all for you. CE. There will be a luncheon on June 5th after the second service for all Christian education teachers, helpers, leaders, and their families. Please sign up in the back today if you would like to attend. Did I say please sign up if you'd like to attend? Okay. They wanted me to announce this and make sure that people heard it, okay? Sign up in the back, please, okay? <laughs> uh, and that's all I have, except that our church office is closed on 5.30, which is Memorial Day. So that's kind of obvious. All right. Josh? God bless. Good morning. It's a great privilege to be up here. I want to thank all of you, whether you knew it or not, you helped send my wife and I to the Truth Matters Conference in, at the Ark Encounter in Kentucky just this past week. We just got back last night. Uh, it was a joy to be there, being amongst contenders of the faith, standing for truth amidst all the chaos and the lies that are in the world today. Um, so again, thank you for, for that blessing. Today, uh, as we honor the graduates, and speak the message to them. You're all included too, so <laughs> enjoy. I hope, it, uh, I hope it does speak to your heart. That it's not just words you're hearing, but it's the, the Holy Spirit speaking through me to your hearts and that the message touches you. Uh, let's turn to Daniel 1 and we'll open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to share your truth. I know that I can't do anything without you, anything good anyways, and that anything that I say, uh, Lord, that it be you speaking through me, and so that your, your truth would be evident in the words today and, in your, and through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so I'm going to read through the first chapter of Daniel. And then I'm going to give you some historical background, context, 
and then I'm going to talk about three main points that I have today. So if you read with me in, uh, or just follow along in chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve the kings in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are who are your age. Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the, ten of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought, brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in, in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. All right, so I'm going to talk about what's going on in this time. So to start off, the Babylonians, when you're, here, when you see, when you're reading through here in the house of Shinar, or the land of Shinar, that's still another name for Babylon. Chaldeans is the culture of the Babylonians. Like a, it's still the Babylonians. It's just that's what we, they refer to the people of that culture. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar was very brilliant. He was brilliant military, militarily, he was brilliant intellectually, he was brilliant uh, socially, he understood people, he understood the times, he had just finished conquering Egypt and they had already, Israel, the, the northern kingdom had already been conquered, now he was going after Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Jehoiakim was the king of that southern kingdom at the time. And he was one of those guys that was a, a stereotypical victim of a bully. So let's say Nebuchadnezzar was the bully, Jehoiakim was the victim. Nebuchadnezzar came in there with all his power, might, strength, said, I'm taking over. But just to show you how powerful I am and how weak you are, I'm only going to take a handful of, of your people. And you can have the rest and you can be king. And so, Nebi, so Jehoiakim was like, you know, it's like a bully that's like, what, what? And the other guy's like, eh, and then just continues to, to be mindful of wherever the bully is and that he doesn't step, you know, 
anger the bully. Nebuchadnezzar knew this. He was very intelligent. So he knew that he didn't have to take Jehoiakim out of power. And he proved that in the neck because then three, two consecutive times after the initial time of being, or of sieging, <laughs> that's not the right word, of going into Judah, taking out a batch. He did that two more times. The first was 606 BC-ish. The next time was 597 and 587 BC. So anyway, the first time, the whole point was to take a batch of people out of there, brainwash them, and then have them be helpers of him to, to bring the rest of the Judah, the inhabitants of Judah, into his country and to also brainwash them. But he wanted the help of uh, their own people to do it. So in a group this size, this would be way more than, than the elite. So they went in and took out, he uh, pinpointed the, the rich families, the elite families, so like the princes, the, the, the wealthy. And in that category, he even pinpointed even more. You've got to be really good looking. You know, physically, no flaws, no, no issues there. You've got to be very intelligent. You've got to be smart, wise, knowledgeable, able to be taught, already knowing stuff. And then you had to be able to hand yourself socially because these, these, these kids are going to be in front of the king and serving in the court of the king. So you had to be beautiful, you had to be smart, and you had to be streetwise, essentially. So he took those people and he was going to brainwash them. Uh, in a group this size, let's say that there was, was 50 to 75, there's, it's about guessed to be about that many people that were taken out with those categories, that filled that category. Out of that category, so let's say everybody here, all raised in the same culture, all raised with the same thinking in the same church, with the same... Uh, Scripture, first five books of the Bible, Psalm, Proverbs, all that same stuff. You're taken out of this culture. Let's say Russia came in, uh, stole this church, everybody in here right now, plucked us all up, threw us in planes, took us over to Russia, and now is going to brainwash us. Out of a size like this, only four of us stood firm in, in the truth. Four. It's not very good odds. Let's look at what those four did. So the first, first thing they had, to, the first challenge that they had was uh, the first area of brainwashing was in literature. It says in uh, verse four through five, they needed people that were. Uh, who possessed wisdom, gifted in wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand. And they were going to teach them the literature, the language, and the ways of the Chaldeans. Okay, so did Daniel put his foot down there? No, he didn't put his foot down. So Daniel is a guy that, that very much wants to follow the ways of the Lord. But when faced with learning and understanding the ways of the Chaldeans, he's okay with that. That's like our kids going out to, to universities and stuff that aren't necessarily Bible colleges. Information and education can always be filtered through the truth of God's Word. Okay, so, and that's the way we need to go about it. They weren't worried because they knew God's Word. They knew the truth. They had it in their hearts. They, they had memorized it. They had understood it. They lived it. So they had no problem with going out because there's nowhere in God's word that says don't go get educated by the world and as far as literature and doctrine and all that kind of stuff, but uh, filter it through my word. And they, did, and they did that. So Daniel didn't put his foot down on there. The next thing they tried to change, they, they changed with their names. Once again, there's no, there was no uh, mandate for them to not change their name. So they let them. They changed their, they had really pretty powerful meanings for their names. So Daniel meant God is my judge. It became Belteshazzar or Bel, protect the king. Bel is another god of the Babylonians. 
the Hananiah's name meant the Lord is gracious, which was changed to Shadrach, which meant command of the Aku. Command of Aku, that's another god. Uh, Mishael, meaning who is the Lord, was given the name Meshach, who is Aku. That's a, so they're taking the names and just twisting and transferring instead of the one true God, they're putting their God as, as the meaning behind it. Uh, Abed, uh, Azariah's name is the Lord is my helper, became Abednego, servant of Nego, or Nebo, which is the God of vegetation. Anyways, still, they changed their names. Still, they had no problem with that because still there was no mandate in God's word for them to not have their names changed because that didn't define who they were in their hearts. Okay? It was just exterior but where did, he, where did he put his foot down? Well, if we keep reading, but Daniel purposed in his heart, this is at verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. Let's back up and just focus on that word heart. He purposed in his heart. So this is where he put his foot down. The lifestyle. This is the lifestyle of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians. So let's back up a little bit more, back to them talking about the king's delicacies, the king's wine. That's what they're going to be served for three years, right? Three years they're going to be served the king's best of the best food. Who wouldn't want that? All the foods that they'd never seen before, that they'd never tried, never had. So what was the big deal about that? And, and they had wine in their culture, Jesus, well, Jesus wasn't at that time yet, but they had wine as a part of their culture, drinking of wine, festivities of wine. The difference, let's talk about the difference, and let's talk about what's, what's really going on there. So when I say the lifestyle, what I'm talking about is everything that goes into the preparing of the king's food. First, they, they offered it to idols. Well, what happened when they did that? They weren't just like, they didn't have just these statues there, throw some foot on there, flip it, you know, check the tenderness, maybe medium rare. Anybody medium? No, that's not what they, what they did. There was a lot more to it than that. They, not only did they put the food before the idols, but this is an evil culture, evil society, where when they offered things to idols, these whole temples that were built to their gods, that involved prostitution of the of the priestess girls. It involved all sorts of debauchery, orgies, all sorts of heinous, vile acts that were an abomination to the Lord. And that's what would happen and all go into the, the sacrificing of this food to the idols before it would go to the people, before it would be going to the, the, the people that would be enjoying the king's delicacies so because of that, because, because all this stuff was offered to idols in that way, now we look at Scripture, and it does say, it does say that they can't do that. Leviticus 11, the whole chapter is all what they can and can't eat, right? And then uh, Exodus 34 also talks about it. We'll go to that in a second. So this is, now let's, let's talk about the wine, what was wrong with the wine. Well, the wine... According in the king's wine was was a fermented wine meant for getting drunk, feeling good, drink more, drink more, get more drunk, get more drunk. This was a problem because Daniel knew that that was not okay, not okay to get to get drunk on wine. That was against the rules. The wine that they had was a wine that was uh, mixed with water because the water at that time didn't have this the sanitation processes that we have today to take the bacteria out. So they put the wine, mixed it with the wine that killed the bacteria, and now they can have it still in moderation so that they didn't get drunk on wine or even tempt to be tempted to go that way. So the water helped the wine not ferment. So when you take the water out, the, the wine will naturally ferment. So they, they resisted that because they knew that that would only lead to clogged mind, bad bad decisions, bad choices, and they would not be looking different from the world. Okay, so there we have it, the lifestyle. 
Let's look at the heart. Let's go back to that word heart. This culture has a, has a tendency to, to communicate to the young people especially, but even to all ages of follow your heart. What's your heart say? Listen to the passions and desires of your heart. Your heart is where, where you make all of the basis of your decision. What's, what are you feeling? Everything's based on what your feeling is or what your, what your uh, emotions are driving you towards. And that's the basis of your decisions. Well, let's see what Scripture says about that. I'm going to, if you like to take notes, if you're ready, because I'm going to just buzz through a whole bunch of Scripture. <laughs> I like to do that. So, first off, when it said Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, what I'm talking about is point number one that I want to talk about. He made no excuses for, for the truth. Okay, so he... When he talked to the, to the eunuch, who the eunuch was also wary about his losing his own head if he didn't obey the king's orders, uh, he, he just kindly went up to the eunuch and was like, hey, can't do this. That'll defile me. And the eunuch was smart enough and intelligent enough at that time to know that when he talked about, when Daniel used the word defile, he knew that he was talking about in relationship to his God. The eunuch was... Daniel did not go up to the eunuch and be like, I demand no wine and no delicacies. And he didn't make a, a nice little sign and chant and try to get Shadrach, Meshach, and Mendo go and walk around in circles and demand it and without caring whatsoever for the eunuch's life, who was also at stake if the eunuch went along with it. He cared. Daniel cared, but he cared more about not defiling himself and not breaking God's rules. Okay? Which began in his heart. So Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. The heart is commonly referred to uh, three different things, four different things actually. The mind as the center of thinking, the emotions, the will, and your whole inner being. So let's look at it as, as Scripture talks about it, referring to the mind Proverbs 3.3 3 says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Proverbs 6.21 Bind them continuously, continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. Talking about emotions. Proverbs 15.15 15, All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. Proverbs 15.30 The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. And a good report makes the bones healthy. This is where it talks about the will. Proverbs eleven twenty: Those who are of a those who are of a perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their ways are His delight. Proverbs fourteen fourteen: The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. Now this is one that talks about the whole inner being. One of my favorites, Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on, not on your own understanding. The heart is the depository of all wisdom and the source of whatever affects your speech. Proverbs 4, 24, Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Sight. Proverbs 4, 25, Let, the eye, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you and your conduct. Proverbs 4.26, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. So we have there an example of at the very core of your being, your heart, which when we say heart, we don't mean this four-chambered thumping muscle that's in your chest. We're talking about your mind, your will, your, your whole inner being, uh, your emotions, all that. As, as Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? This is why the focus of our hearts should be on things above, not on earthly things, because it's so easily deceived. Okay? And this is what is made a point that Daniel, in his heart, he purposed that he would not defile himself. So he didn't go out there with the, with the idea of, well, I'm human. I'm human. I'm going to make mistakes. So, 
that'll be a justification for me to just kind of do what they do, and I'll just throw out an excuse out there. I'm human, you know, I can't, I'm not perfect. Is that really, because of course we're not perfect, and of course we are human, but is that really the heart of the issue? Or did you already purpose in your heart that you're going to do wrong, and you're just going to throw an excuse in there? Daniel, he purposed in his heart that he was going to make the right choice no matter what, no matter what he faced. Second point, Daniel was unashamed of the one true God. Exodus 34, 14, 15 says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you and you eat of its sacrifice. Does that make sense? So Daniel was unashamed of the God, the one true God, the only God that called his people to be separate from the world, to live apart, to take a stand and to be obedient to his word no matter the cost. This wasn't the only time Daniel faced an opposition to what he believed as opposed to what the world believed. We all know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. So this wasn't the first and only time he was going to get challenged into what he believed. He was challenged continuously with the different kings that he served underneath. And yet he still purposed in his heart to be true to the one true God, regardless if that meant sacrificing his own life. He was okay with that. To the next point, Moses, I just want to show you a couple of the people that, that took a stand for truth as well, for God's word. Moses took his stand. We see that in Hebrews 11, 24 through 26 says, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than riches that, than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. There's no reward in, in being friends with the world and looking like them. There's only reward when you set your heart and your mind for the purposes of God. The psalmist took his stand in Psalm 119, verse 115, says, Depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Jesus took his stand. Hebrews 7, 26, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Second Corinthians 6, we have in verse 14 through 16, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for whatever, what fellowship has righteousness with, law, with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? So this is Paul speaking there to the Corinthians, but don't, don't hear me wrong. You can't remove, and the purpose is not to remove ourselves from the world. As far as our physical beings, we are supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. What that means is you, you filter everything in the world through, this, through the word of God, through the truth that's in Scripture, just like Daniel did, he filtered through the education, he filtered through the philosophy, he filtered through all the, the wisdom, and then they were an intelligent group of people, but he filtered through all that through God's word, held true to God's word, even let them change his name, whatever. But when it came down to lifestyle, there he put his foot down because God has specific, specific instructions in Scripture for our lifestyle. And when you embrace the lifestyle of the world, when you embrace that as, I'm going to just do a little bit. I'm just going to allow for a little bit of this or a little bit of that. I'm going to look like them a little bit here. Does it ever stop at just a little bit? Can you actually control how much of that little bit you embrace? Or does it become very difficult to identify whether you're a believer or you're just an unbeliever? This is why Daniel took a stand, not because he couldn't have 
Not because he could have taken a glass of the king's wine and mixed it with water and made it so it was okay for him. He didn't even want to have the appearance of looking like the world. He wanted nothing to do with it. And he wanted to be identified as a child of God. Case closed. Period. Daniel stood... uh, Point three, Daniel stood firm in his trust and allegiance of God. God honored Daniel, protected him this time and later in the, like we talked about in the lion's den. Uh, he sovereignly worked in the hearts of the heathen for, for Daniel to find favor among them. I want to make this point clear. God didn't honor Daniel in hopes that Daniel would, would be obedient to him. God didn't honor Daniel because he thought maybe eventually Daniel would come around and and get around to to doing what he wanted him to do. First, Daniel was obedient. Then God honored him. It's a pretty important, important order there. First, Daniel did in his heart, all the way into the core of his being, did what was right in the sight of God. God did some amazing things. He he brought Daniel into the favor of and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. God also gave them knowledge, skill, and all literature and all wisdom. And Daniel had an understanding of visions and dreams, even visions and dreams that, he, that the king couldn't even tell him. I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Daniel, but there's a story where the king didn't tell anybody what he dreamed and told all his wise men that they need to tell him what he dreamed and, and to interpret it. Like, who in the world is going to do that? Who in the world but, but somebody that God found favor in, Daniel, who did tell the king what he dreamed and interpreted it. But that wasn't because of some Daniel's great power. Daniel was a flesh and blood person just like you and I. It actually started when they were first going through this time. I forgot to mention that when they were first taken captive, they were the ages of our graduates, if not a little bit younger, ages 14 to 17-ish. That's why I tell these kids, and I, 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 we talk about some pretty deep theological stuff in, in Sunday school, and I like to do that as, as well in youth group, uh, to challenge them, because I told them I, I hold them at a higher, higher standard than the society today holds teenagers. They're capable of a lot more mentally, physically, intellectually than what, what society gives them. You know, and I want to I challenge them to come up to the higher level because the world certainly is not going to do it. The world wants to keep them down, show them you're supposed to screw up, you're supposed to do all this stuff at this age because that's when you do it. That's when it's okay. You don't have to start being smart till you're a lot older. I don't believe that. I believe our, our teens are capable of much more, and I challenge them to that. Yeah. One thing is this. I want you guys to remember this. Daniel, to find favor among... Daniel uh, was given favor by God among the heathens, but that was never Daniel's goal. That was never his goal to go out and find favor among the the heathens. Daniel's goal primarily, and that started at the heart, was to put God first and to follow his, his, his orders and, his, and to be obedient to God, period. Whatever the result. If that meant him dying, so be it. If that meant others dying, so be it. He left that to God. Lo and behold, God took care of him. God honored him. God rose him to, to some pretty powerful levels that he was high ranking for the 70 years that he was in uh, in captivity which mind you he was in captivity for the 70 years God never took him out of that captivity he didn't free him from the rule of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians because that's exactly where God had him for that time and this time in our culture and the society young people you are in this time in this Point in history with all the difficulties that, are, that you're seeing out there for a purpose. 
It's not an accident you're born when you're born. You have a purpose, and you are exactly where you're supposed to be at exactly the right time you're supposed to do that to be here. Bodie Bachman said this. You can avoid persecution. You can. You can avoid any kind of suffering or any kind of hard times or all you got to do is compromise. That's all you got to do. You got to compromise. Compromise your faith and, and nobody's going to mess with you. Nobody's going to persecute you. But where's the retur- eternal reward in that? There's none. Let's not compromise our faith. Let's not compromise our trust in God. Let's not compromise the truth of God's word. Let's understand that everything in here is complete. There's no more revelation. This is complete. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it. It's, it's done, full, complete, finished. Everything that we need is right here. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. One way or another, God honors those who honor him. Second Chronicles, 6, 6, 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. I want to make a footnote here that when it talks about the, the diet that, that uh, Daniel requested, the vegetables and the water, this is not a mandate that everybody who wants to follow God go out and eat only vegetables and water. It's not what that's talking about. Don't build a whole entire religion off of that. Out of the options that were presented to Daniel, that's what he could eat without being in disobedience to God. Okay? So they had... The Israelites, the Jews, they had their own meat prepared a certain way and limited in the Old Testament that would keep them separate from everybody else for that purpose, to keep them separate from the world. Now we don't have those restrictions. So I don't want anybody thinking that you can only eat vegetables if you're going to follow God. Because that's not true. And you can drink more than just water. Soda's fine too. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, the intoxication is not, especially if you're going to be in a leadership position. Let's, let's keep that clear. Daniel wanted to separate himself from the world. Leaders in the church are called to a higher standard than everybody else, not even to have the appearance of. We actually all are called to that, not even have the appearance of. So let's be mindful of that when we're making choices moving forward. Daniel didn't want to tempt intoxication. He didn't want to have that even be a, a something that might happen. So although he could have had mixed wine with water, he chose, he chose to be completely done and void of that so that there wasn't even the appearance. I want to keep making that clear. Also, uh, Scripture calls us throughout the whole thing to be separate from the world. James talks about it. First John talks about it being in the world but not of the world. We can't be witnesses to the world when we, when we look just like them. But we are called to spread the gospel, spread the truth. So now I'd like to ask my beautiful wife to come up here and share what she has, what Lord's pla- least laid on her heart. For most, not all of you, I'm sorry to tell you, I will forever remember you as the wide-eyed sixth graders who somewhat timidly but most assuredly excitedly bounded up the stairs to youth group. 
With this sentiment in mind, I ask you to humor me and allow me to read you a story. This book is called The Moon is Always Round. When I look up on a sunny day, the sky is blue and bright, and jet planes paint white lines on its canvas. When I look up on a stormy day, the sky is gray and dull, and clouds pour rain, and flash and boom with lightning and thunder. When I look up on a summer's evening, the sky is red and orange and purpley pink, and the sun looks like it's falling from the sky on fire. When I look up on a clear night, the sky is dark, and the stars twinkle and sparkle like diamonds. But the moon isn't always round. Dad said, the moon is always round, even when you can't see all of it. When Dad told me that I was getting a little sister, the moon looked like a banana. But Dad said, the moon is always round. When the crib was put together, the moon looked like a slice of apple, but Dad said, the moon is always round. When Mummy's tummy began to look like a watermelon, the moon looked like the shriveled orange, but Dad said, the moon is always round. Even when I was told that my little sister wasn't coming to live with us after all the waiting, Dad said, the moon is always round. When my parents left in the middle of the night for the hospital and the next morning I went off to preschool and I thought, will the moon be round tonight? Dad said, the moon is always round. When I waited at the hospital to meet my little sister and we left without her, I asked, why, Daddy? And he replied, I don't know why, but the moon is always round. When we got home from the hospital, I looked for the moon before bed. It was a half moon. But Dad said the moon is always round. And when it was still just the three of us and we went to the church to say goodbye, my dad asked me, what shape is the moon? I said, the moon is always round. And Dad said, what does that mean? And I said, God is always good. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 105. So why did I tell you this story? The moon serves as a good illustration to teach us about God. Even when we cannot see the whole moon as it orbits around the earth, it doesn't change the fact that the moon is always round. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we live by faith and not by sight. Ty, Isaiah, Gabe, McKenna, Juliana, as you all head off in different directions, may you hold fast to the following two truths. There will be times in your life when things don't make sense, when you will struggle to see how any good could come of a situation, and the temptation will be to doubt God or to pull away from him. Remember in those times that just because you cannot always see God's goodness through the pain doesn't mean that God is not good. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good. His mercies are over all of his works. The moon is always round. Throughout your life, you're going to be told that God and his word cannot be trusted. Everything you were taught as truth, the world will tell you is a lie. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. When something you learn contradicts scripture, go to the word and study the words very carefully. If after careful consideration, the Bible still clearly means what you had previously gleaned, then question the idea that contradicts God's word. His word is true. And just because we do not always have the answers doesn't change that truth. The moon is always round. Congratulations to each of you. Josh and I are so very proud of you and your hard work and your determination. Now go forth in confidence that God will equip you where he calls you if you seek him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, 
and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, stand. Ephesians 10 through 13. So at this time, Josh and I would like to present each of you with your own study Bible. May his word be your light in the darkness. So if we could have each of our graduates come up. Hey guys, uh, thanks for everybody for coming, and I just want to thank everybody for always being here my whole life uh, that I've been at this church. It's always been warm and welcoming, and everybody's loved me and has helped me grow as a person and in my faith. And I want to thank Josh and Erica specifically uh, for the, with the youth group. I learned so much, and it was really they taught me to make God my own and have a personal relationship with Him versus just following my parents' faith. It's now my own, and I'm really thankful for it. And as I go out into the world as an adult, I want to take that with me, and I want to always be able to go to him and appreciate him. And whenever I face problems and adversity, that I can trust him, and he'll lead me through. Uh, I'm going into firefighting. I'd like to. And uh, my mom, I know, uh, was specifically worried about it. But I learned throughout the years I've been here, and that doesn't matter what I do, uh, he's going to protect me either way. There's nothing I can do that can change one day that he has, or I'm not going to die one day before he's ready for me, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, thanks for everybody for always supporting me and praying for me throughout my life, and I hope you guys will continue to, and thank you. Good morning, friends and family. My name is McKenna Seidel. I have been a member of this church for 17 years now. I began my journey of faith here, and each of you have offered me overwhelming love and support. I could not be more appreciative of what each of you have done for me. God has been working so intricately through me and through this church. He has taught me to be compassionate, generous, respectful, and loving towards all people. I have found a genuine love for life by giving mine to God the Father. It has been an amazing journey through Cubbies, Awana, TNT, and then youth group. I learned about hope, peace, and patience because the Lord knew I would need each of these things as I grew older. I can confidently say God has blessed me with each of these attributes, and I ha live a happier life because of it. Even though our time within the youth group is almost over, they have impacted me immensely. Josh and Erica Perkins, as well as the other amazing leaders and students, have encouraged me week after week and prayed for the safety and health of my family. That group in itself is a family, and I'm blessed to have known each one of them. Each week's lessons have always seemed to coincide with struggles I've been internally facing. I always thought it was funny that they knew exactly what to say to guide me. I know now that it wasn't their words speaking, but God speaking through them to me. I am super excited to take one of my final trips with the youth group to Camp Snowbird this July. I believe it will solidify and strengthen my faith in God before I move into the college atmosphere this fall. I will be attending Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan to study biomedical engineering. I chose this path because I combine my love for math and physics with the health and wellness of people. I am so excited for this new chapter of my life, and I can't wait to see how God uses me there. I ask for continued prayer for confidence and stability in my faith, as well as peace in being so far away from home. I also pray that I will not be buried in the snow on my way to class. <laughs> I want to thank the church and everyone in it for their incredible, 
incredible support for so far in my journey. I could not have done it without you and without the support of God. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Juliana. Um, first, I would like to thank the church for all their support, not only for me, but for the youth group. I've always felt loved walking through these doors, and no matter what I was facing, I was greatly encouraged to know I had prayer warriors fighting my battles with me. You have all impacted me in ways more than you know. As I am now graduated, I plan to attend Wisconsin Lutheran College, which is where my sister goes, and pursue a doctorate in Christian counseling. As many of you would know, college and life after high school, in other words, this thing called adulting, um, comes with great challenges along the way. It'd be greatly appreciated if you would pray for me as I begin my new journey. Please pray that I'm a light to my college and that the Holy Spirit will work in me towards what God called me to do. I pray that God would provide me with guidance and wisdom as he gives me new opportunities each and every day. Also pray that I would continue to prioritize him above all else as I am about to get very busy this upcoming fall. I want everyone to understand how much the youth group has imp impacted my life and changed me. Through the ups and downs of life, I have always had a home at youth group. The youth group is a place where I could let all my worries go for two hours each Wednesday and fellowship with those I love dearly. They were never judgmental when it came to trials people were facing. Rather, vulnerability was encouraged, and we would always bring those trials to the Lord together. The youth group was the first place I really began to open myself up, not just with being outgoing, but to allow God to use the scars in my life to further gain an understanding of who he is, and as I got older, help younger kids gain an understanding of who he is. I love watching the kids ask questions and see their hearts on fire for God. My key word from this, wor from this year, which really stood out to me, was the word obedience. Growing up, I never put an emphasis on how important obedience was in my faith journey and really applying myself to what God called me to do. The youth group secured my confidence that God is working in me and has given me a purpose. I have observed him placing me in certain positions, connected to certain people, and in different places where I know I am able to know him further, and I believe these weren't by mistake. For example, one of my favorite things that God has done in my life has given me an older brother who I'm able to love and care for every day. He has taught me my biggest life lessons and allowed me to practice selflessness, love, and patience all firsthand. Another example of God's work in my life is my connection to Isaiah, a fellow senior being celebrated today. If it weren't for Isaiah coming into my life, I would have never been able to gain the blessing of a friendship with Alex Rennie, who is continuing to put on a great fight for his life if you could all continue to pray for him. Through Alex, God has taught me the importance of trusting him and holding on to his promises. Alex also showed me what faithfulness looks like. In just these past few years, especially now, I've witnessed pain in ways that are unimaginable. I believe God called me and this group to be a vessel of hope who is strong in the truth of the gospel when our circumstances leave us weak on our knees. A friend of mine reached out to me a few days ago asking about their questions for God and if they'll ever receive an answer. In response, I talked about how God answers our questions in three ways. Yes, no, and wait. Waiting is the hardest one in my opinion, especially in the situations when the ending seems so blurred. We want to know things immediately. We don't want to wait. God's time frame is much different than ours, but his time frame is perfect, even when we don't understand. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Sometimes we have to wait a week, a month, a year, or sometimes the rest of our lives. I believe God reveals himself and I know through some of the hardest trials, we can see how God is good. But there's still a present why, though, that's floating around. Those we may not know until we get to heaven ourselves. That's where trust comes in. 
and trusting that God is good even when our circumstances are not and that there's a purpose for the pain. This is one of the hardest things to do, but God promises to always be by our side. This group, particularly my small senior group, is family to me. I know they will all leave a mark for Jesus wherever they go and be a light to everyone around them. I'm so proud of them and I'm lucky to have grown up with such an amazing group of now adults. I will forever be grateful for the time we spent together, getting to know each other every Wednesday from six, six